have a wonderful partnership with the School of Regulation uh, because we have put together a program uh, that looks, first of all, at the regulatory and technical context of this industry, but then looks at what does this mean for business models, business model innovation, strategy implementation, and change inside the TSOs and the DSOs uh, for high potentials. Um, uh, I very much want to welcome somebody who had uh, the last few days an incredible agenda, uh, Commissioner Hedegaard. Thank you for uh, uh, making the effort to be with us. I know you only have a short time, so uh, I will not introduce you long. Uh, you are our person for climate action, and thank you very much for sharing uh, your thoughts with us. Thank you. Does it work? Not too much, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Thank you very much to the Florence School of Regulation, not only for arranging this today, but I also know that you're putting quite some emphasis on climate change uh, that is very much appreciated. I also think it's very much needed because, as you will imagine, climate change is not something that will just go away someday, then we don't have to discuss it anymore. So whatever you can do there uh, also to contribute to the, to the debate in this qualified manner is incredibly important. Uh, I must say that, yeah, okay, is that better? Okay, so now you can hear what I say. Okay, but I said thank you, and now I'll just start uh, with the rest. Um, as the Dean just indicated, it's true that some of us spent the last week in, in Warsaw. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, obviously, but uh, maybe it would be good just to say uh, one just in one minute to sort of say what came out of that, because we can all sort of agree probably how frustratingly slow the international climate process is. But having said that, I would say that we actually got a decent outcome of Warsaw. Why? Because it was uh, agreed that there has to be a very clear timeline. How do we get to Paris? Who has to do what in order for us to get a meaningful and ambitious outcome from Paris? And one of the things needed there is that everybody now has to go home and do their homework, meaning prepare what they as countries are ready to contribute in Paris. But it's not good enough that they just come to Paris and tell the rest of the world what they want to do. Europe had a good time before Warsaw said no. We need to have these reflections be known by the rest of the world in good time before Paris so that we can see when we know all the intentions, is that then adding up to where the world combined, globally speaking, needs to be? And this was actually acknowledged by saying that by first quarter of 2015, those who are ready to do so should come forward with these different contributions and all should be uh, ready to come with this in good time before Paris. What we are now moving into is sort of a hybrid between the top-down approach that was tried to, to be achieved many times, but also moving away from a totally bottom-up approach where the countries just do what they intend to, what, what they want to do. And that is why this word intended is very important that there will now be a phase from after they have sort of agreed back home, this is what we intend to do, then there will be nine months for the global community to discuss, is this all in all enough? And if not, how are we going to cope with that? So this is sort of the hybrid between the top down and the bottom up. I'm not going to say a lot more about that, but just to say basically overall, it was a decent outcome also with some of the elements that I'm not going into now. I do not know how much you're all climate specialists. I know that many of you will be dealing with energy. And therefore, I would like just to show a very short video here uh, for you. And um, it's coming up here. Because, you know, when we talk about this climate change, what is it? What does it mean? And you can read a lot of scientific reports. What you have here, that is not a prognosis. This is not a forecast. This is the world temperature as it had been actually measured concretely 
at stations throughout the world, combined by a very well-known and respected Norwegian climate scientist. And you can see that for many, many years it goes up and down. It is bluish, meaning cooler. It is yellow and red, meaning warmer, but it goes back to normal. Until uh, this is where it starts to get interesting. Look what is happening over the last 30 years. Without going into the details, I think this just gives us a flavor about why is it that some of us think that it's really important that we get it right on climate change. And that's also why when we at the same time know that in this world that is reflected up there 2012, I mean, that is a 0 0.8 degrees average temperature increase. That's how the big differences are. And you can see where countries will be particularly hit. In that world, we're also going to be more and more people <coughs> asking for more and more growth, more and more commodities. I think this very clearly spells quite a challenge. And that is why in the Commission, what we are trying now to discuss, what are we going to do after 2020? And when we, despite of the economic crisis, is now preparing the 2030 framework, it's because we know this challenge is not going away. We actually think that we have, we have three crises. We have an economic crisis in Europe, hopefully getting out of it slowly, slowly, but on the right track to do that. We have a social and job crisis, 26 million unemployed people in Europe, and then the climate and resource crisis and challenges did not go away while we were busy handling the economic crisis. So we believe if we are wise, then we try to combine in our thinking how we address all these three crises combined. And I personally think that it's quite interesting that in recent months we have seen the number one at the World Bank, Jim Kim, the number one in the IMF, Christine Lagarde, and number one in the OECD, Mr. Angel Goya, all in big speeches on the economic state of the world. They have actually dedicated quite a portion of these speeches to climate change because their point is we won't get it right on our economic challenges, our growth challenges, our development challenges, on, unless we get it right on, on climate change. I'm sure that today, by some of the previous speakers, you have already heard some of the things we are planning uh, in the Commission. Uh, you've probably heard about the process that now we will come out with our proposal from the Commission on the 21st of January. Uh, that is just a um, few days before we go to, to Davos, the World Economic Forum, some of us, where this time this year, a whole day has been dedicated at the very big stages uh, just to discuss this relationship between climate development e uh, economy. 21st of January, we will propose, uh, I very much hope, and I think, uh, what we will suggest from the Commission, so that the heads of states can discuss the 2030 proposal at their summit in March. That is what they have earlier said that they will be doing. And that means that Europe will start this discussion well in advance of Paris, but also well in advance of Ban Ki-moon's uh, leaders summit, as he will be calling 23rd of September next year in New York. I've been asked uh, as a headline here, is there a need for a major overhaul? The very sort of short uh, answer would be no. I don't think so. But of course, there will have to be some changes, some adjustments. There are some uh, experiences that should be reflected now in whatever we come up with now for after 2020. It cannot just be a copy-paste of 2020. For instance, if there are more than one target, what would be the interaction between targets? What will be the interaction between different targets and the emissions trading scheme? I think that was one of the areas where uh, maybe things uh, could be be, be done in an even more smart way. Now when we have the experiences after the, the, the first set of targets. Um, but I basically think that we have learned the lesson in Europe that it works when we set targets. I don't know how would it have looked 
if we had had an historic economic crisis as we have had, and we would not have ha had the binding targets for CO2 emissions reductions for renewables as we have had, would we then still have seen the same expansion in renewables in Europe as we have actually seen also during the crisis year? I have a background also in national government, and I know what it means when you have binding EU targets. That helps national governments to stay sort of focused uh, on these uh, different issues. So that is why basically the, the, the tool of setting targets at the European level, it has worked. Uh, I would also argue maybe to the surprise of some, but basically our emissions trading scheme has also worked. Are there some challenges? Definitely there are, maybe we can come back to it, but basically it has done its work. It would have been strange, wouldn't it, if we had a system like the emissions trading scheme running into an historic economic crisis and then that would not at all have been affected by this economic crisis foreseen by nobody. I mean, that would be the only part of the economy, basically, that would not have, have been affected. So there were some special challenges. We're trying to address that. Uh, but basically, uh, I think that the instruments as such work. Also, we think one of the key po components that we really need uh, to look maybe even more at now uh, in the next set of targets. That is also how does en everything here play together with the energy dependency. Europe is on track, contrary to other regions like for instance the United States, to become more and more energy dependent. Not less and less energy dependent, more and more energy dependent. Uh, last year, crisis year 2012, we already spent 545 billion euros to pay for our imported fossil fuels from outside. 545 billion euros. I think that it goes without saying to address efficiency more, to look more into renewables. That is something that as a longer term strategy, a mid term strategy could bring down that kind of, of cost and, and that kind of expenses in Europe. <coughs> We also have this, and that is something that is very much present in our preparatory work right now. In the Commission, we think that it is absolutely key for Europe that we continue to Europeanize European energy policies. There is a tendency in the debate as if sort of each member state, they could just define for themselves what do they want, where are they heading, and energy planning would sort of stop at the borders. What Europe needs is not less Europeanized energy thinking, it is more Europeanized energy thinking. And we really believe that EU level targets can drive this. That is, by the way, also why we have just adopted a budget for the next seven years, uh, where 20% of the whole budget will have trackable to support our climate transition, our low carbon transition, and with a lot of money through structural funds and regional funds and what have we, that will go into efficiency, energy, uh, infrastructure, things like that. We have, of course, one very big challenge in Europe, and that is the energy costs. And that will obviously also be very much addressed in not only the impact assessment, but also in the proposal that we will present. It goes without saying, that the European policies have to be cost efficient. But if it is truly cost efficient, it must of course also include in the whole calculation some of the co-benefits. Some of the co-benefits, it could be for energy dependency there, it's difficult to say what is sort of the value of that. That's a more political thing, at least to, to many of our member states. Uh, what are some of the co-benefits for health, for instance, uh, if we are having cleaner air because we change our energy system, things like that. So we must talk about the cost-efficient pathway, but we also have to sort of understand that the least cost now is not always what is the most cost-efficient uh, way to go in the medium and long term. Uh, also, there is, of course, an element here about where is it that the job potential is highest, and that is actually if you have quite a component of efficiency and, and renewables. When in the Commission we analyzed up to 2020, 
where is the potential, which sectors do have the potential in Europe to create a net contribution to job creation? Basically, three sectors came out. Health, because we're getting older and older in Europe. ICT, communication. And then what you could call the green sector, renewables, efficiency, waste handling, recycling. There is a huge potential of creating net jobs if we do it in, in, in the right way. Also, one of the things we are discussing when we are looking at the energy cost side, obviously, will be the uh, subsidies for renewables. And one of the challenges we have had in recent years, and where we cannot just sort of continue business as usual in the world after 2020, that is that we have had two generous support schemes in a number of member states, so that those who will say, oh, it, uh, renewables made our energy bill uh, too costly, to a certain extent has a point. But I also have to say that they sometimes forget that there are so many other reasons why the energy bill have come up. Uh, not enough integrated energy systems, uh, not a sort of a, a gas price that, that is still linked to the oil price. I mean, many, many, many other factors. And we are trying to identify them so there will come a paper on the energy cost side, try to get the facts right and not just the myths. What, why is it that we have an energy cost issue? But we will try to come out also with uh, something on the subsidies side so that we will take care that we have a more dynamic and a more flexible way of subsidizing renewables so that you will subsidize mature, uh, you, uh, immature uh, technologies, but not uh, mature technologies. In the world after, in Europe after 2020, we will have mature renewables technologies that will not demand a lot of subsidies. It was, of course, never the intention that we should have subsidies for renewables forever after. It must be a more flexible, a more dynamic system, and I hope that will be reflected also in what will come out of the co uh, Commission uh, after uh, New Year in the first quarter of, of 2014 from Almunia, the competition uh, commissioner on how to subsidize things. I know that some people uh, would say, yes, but we still have to be extremely careful about competitiveness, about the carbon leakage, I think that what we have in the present system is some safeguards as to avoid that. And uh, we have no intention basically to, to change that. Uh, the, the fact that those who are most exposed to, to carbon leakage, to competition from outside Europe, they get most of their or all of their allowances for free. There are ways to handle that and that is why the commission recently could publish a paper saying we cannot see that there has been carbon leakage. That's again, getting the fact right compared to the, the, the miss. However, there would be a risk, wouldn't there, that we could see a low carbon leakage if we are not continuing to do innovation in these fields where we know that global demands will be significantly uh, increasing in years to come. One thing I would mention where we should not copy the up to 2020 framework and that's one of my last points. That is, uh, we have had the possibility of a lot of offsetting, meaning you could buy projects outside Europe. Because that is very cost efficient, at least in the short term. So we have spent quite a significant amount of money, companies have done as well, to pay China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, what have we, to <coughs> make some transition in a long-term strategy where we need to go to 80 to 95% reduction by the middle of this century, that might not be the wisest strategy in the midterm and in the long term, not to get the transition that we need in our different sectors, not only in the ETS sector, but also in transport, in agriculture, in buildings, and, and, and what have we. So that is why we, we really believe that we should be very much focused on, we need to make the transition domestically also in uh, Europe. Um, final point maybe, because I do not know if you have been discussing this earlier today, but of course some would say yes, but it's all very fine. But if we have a problem with energy costs and all these things and competitiveness, look what is happening in the United States, couldn't we just do, do shale gas and then everybody would be, be happy? Let me be very clear that the Commission would 
not prevent anybody in doing shale gas if they want to do shale gas. The only concern we have is that if European countries want to do shale gas, we should take care that the environmental legislation around it is good and, and, and decent and avoid some of the problems that they had in the United States. But having said that, I think that we must be realistic that we will never see the kind of low gas prices as they have seen in the United States. There are some, I do not know if it's because they do not know it or because if it's their interest, that seem to sort of argue very much in the public domain that if only we did like the Americans and extracted shale gas, then we could have gas prices come down to similar levels. Uh, we have looked into this in the commission and there is nothing that indicates that that would be the case for numerous reasons, not going into details, more uh, challenging geological formations. We are much more densely populated uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, it seems to be more and more what people who really are experts in this area would advise us be careful. Shale gas could be one component, but it will not mean that it's still not uh, what pays best off for Europe, that would be efficiency and renewables. That's also what the International Energy Agency tells us. So um, this is some of the elements that are at the table right now in this rather complex exercise. Um, I can tell you it's, it's not an easy paper. It's not an easy exercise. I'm sure it also will not be an easy exercise with um, with the member states. Uh, the very final point I should mention is, of course, as part of that paper will also be an a reform of the emissions trading system. Uh, there will be have to be uh, different things that we can do. You will know we have had six options out for public consultation. We are trying to narrow it down. Now when backloading has sort of gone, gone through and will be formally endorsed by the parliament 10th of December, we are moving to the more structural options. And the plan as of now is that that will be part of what the commission will present on the 21st of January. Just in conclusion, when I hear the debate, it's sometimes as if some people still have this misunderstanding, as if Europe is alone in the world moving in this field. That is just so wrong. Yes, we have problems getting people to commit formally at the negotiation table in Warsaw or, or elsewhere. But I really do believe that a lot of other countries and economies, they have understood why in the 21st century, with this uh, video that I showed you only continuing, they have really understood why to address efficiency, renewables, low carbon technologies, that is not something that will harm their competitiveness. That's something that if we do it right and intelligently and coherently can enhance competitiveness. And it would, in my view, be a very big mistake if Europe now, because we are still sort of in this crisis mode, shy away from taking the ne next set of decisions that we have to take if we are to protect the front runner positions that we have actually created here. How many other areas can you find where you really can see that we have a front runner position that also has the potential of creating a lot of export possibilities and job possibilities? So. We will be pushing forward for this. I'm sure that we will come up with something meaningful. Uh, all the details you will know more of uh, by 21st of January. There are still two months to go. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. I want to add actually something in the spirit of climate policy. The Commissioner came by train from Berlemont to this place. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it served two purposes. <laughs> okay. We have five minutes, so uh, questions are welcome. Yes, uh, there. Yeah. Don't we have a second? It's Barbara S. Reuters. Is that better? Can you hear me? <laughs> it's Barbara for Barbara Lewis from Reuters. You, you said it won't be easy, and you also said that Warsaw 
wasn't so bad. Um, but hearing all the voices that we do from the business community about the cost, how are you going to persuade people that in, in March they should have as I understand it, there is a need for a political agreement on 2030 if we're going to get things done in time. Do you see the March summit as the deadline, or is there more flexibility than that? Thank you. Well, the leaders of Europe, when they discussed energy back in May, welcomed our green paper on this and said they would come back to the discussion in March. In that sense, what they want to do with that, that is not for the Commission to decide. We are going to deliver as we have said we will and that they have encouraged us to, to do. I think that what is important for Europe is that there is an overall sense of direction. Where are we going? What we will be presenting mid-January, that is not a very prescriptive legislative proposal. Uh, that is not where we are at this stage. So it's a more sort of discussion where are we going? How many targets, ambition levels, things like that. That is what, what, what I would uh, hope would be the discussion in, in March and what I think is sort of implied in what has already been said by, by the leaders of Europe. Of course, we are also very much mindful in the Commission about sort of the timing from April when European Parliament will go into election mode uh, and, and all these things starting. There, therefore, we think it's good to have this discussion already in March because by, as I said, 23rd of September, many of our leaders will be going to Ban Ki-moon's Leaders Summit in New York, and there he will expect, and he has been very explicit about that, he will expect everybody, basically, to be ready and stand up and say, this is what we are planning to do. And I think that most people can see that it would be practical, wouldn't it, if Europe then had a more or less united uh, position. Uh, instead of just everybody sort of saying what, what, what they might do and what they might not do. So we hope that we have a substantial discussion in, in March. That is what they have, that, that's what they themselves in the Council are planning for. Maybe two short questions, yes. Yeah, my name is uh, Karel Beckman, uh, energypost.eu. Uh, um, you said uh, ETS was a resounding success, well, more or less. It but was not exactly <laughs> my words, I think, but uh, you are a journalist, so okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, w I was kidding, but um, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, uh, emissions went up in Germany and you said so yourself just now that we cannot expect very low gas prices. Should we not have, in addition to the ETS, uh, uh, emission performance standards for power plants in Europe, like the US has adopted? That's true that the United States, they have not adopted it yet, but uh, they are in the process of preparing it. Uh, but they also do not have uh, a system with pricing. Uh, and there, of course, we have to take care whether we are double regulating or, or not. And I have to correct you on this uh, German side. It's true that due to cheap coal being exported from the United States when they do not need it themselves, then we have seen a sort of slight uptake of, of, of that. But basically, also in Germany, in the period we are talking about here, the period where we have been working with the 2020 uh, targets, Germany has also reduced their emissions. Okay, then the last question, perhaps. Hello, Mukun Bhagwat from one of the energy intensive industry. It's good to know that the carbon leakage measures will exist also in the new framework. But how do you define carbon leakage? Is it only when the companies shut down here and go out? Or is it when the investments stop decreasing in Europe? Can you please? Comment? I just think that we have some policies in place in order to address where there might be a problem for certain sectors. But, you know, I hear from many sectors sometimes that due to climate policies or energy price, they are moving out. It's just when we go down and analyze it specifically, then often climate is, is used as the main reason where it is not the main reason. Uh, can I give you an example? I did not get which uh, sector you came from, but for instance, the steel sector. They have often said, oh, it's because of, of uh, the, the ETS and it's weighing down on our economy. ArcelorMittal last year when they presented uh, their annual sort of uh, account, they 
admitted that due to selling of more uh, emission, uh, allowances than they ac actually could use, they had made a deficit into a, a surplus. So, so it's just one example. I'm not saying that everything is easy. And I'm not sort of uh, making a small thing out of companies struggling in Europe these days. I just say that when we discuss what is the cure, it is incredibly important that we ge get the diagnosis right. And there has been a tendency lately in certain industry circles to sort of say it's because of climate or it's because of energy or it's because of renewables where it cannot be justified if you look at the uh, real facts. There are different situations in different member states, for instance, on the energy price cost. But it's just, we, we must get the proportions right. A very final point. In the UK recently, they discussed this. The average household in UK saw an increase of their energy bill this year of 112 pounds. <coughs> Some blame that on green policies. So there was arranged a hearing in the UK, in the British Parliament. And there, the big CEOs, or the, the, the leaders of the six big energy companies, they sat there with the parliamentarians. And they could find out that around 10 pounds could be a credit to climate policies. About 15 points had something to do with the energy infrastructure. About another 10 pounds had something to do with wholesale prices. That makes all in all 35 pounds. There's still a way up to the 112. Uh, I have not heard if they have been able to explain that gap. I'm just saying, be careful not to jump to conclusions because uh, we also have had many good things out of the climate uh, issues, out of the energy policies, and we should not do less of that in the future. We have to do more, if not for other reasons, also because climate change is for real and our competitors are starting to realize this as well. Thank you, Ms. Hedegaard, for bringing your message loud and clear, if I may say. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks. So we continue. We continue. Okay, let's continue with the uh, next point on the agenda where we can debate uh, elements that uh, Commissioner Hedegaard bring, uh, brought on the table. Uh, I think, uh, in a nutshell, it's uh, uh, very uh, difficult to, to summarize how many issues come together. For that reason, we will have a package coming forward in January. And the big question that bothers us at the European Commission, and by the way, I'm Jos Delbeke, I, I work with Commissioner <laughs> Hedegaard uh, in, uh, <laughs> in the European Commission on this 2030 framework. The big question that bothers us is we had a package developed for 2020. What are the good and the less good elements in order to translate towards the package for 2030? And that is the subject of our debate today. And Mrs. Hedegaard was uh, bringing on the table already the question of targets. We had three targets in the past, the target for greenhouse gas emissions, for renewables, for energy efficiency. We had a raft of measures. We had an ETS, we had an energy efficiency directive, a renewable directive, and other directives too long to uh, enumerate here. There is the issue related to competitiveness and carbon leakage, and there is the issue related to offsets. So uh, quite a number of elements on the table. Now we have a panel today and we have uh, four distinguished panelists, and I will give them the floor, and I have prepared a specific question to each of them, but I'm first going to introduce the panel. Uh, there is uh, Mr. Dirk Beusart um, from GDF Suez. Uh, he is the uh, advisor of the CEO, Monsieur Mestralet, and he is also the CEO of Electrabel, a well-known company in this country. Um, then we have uh, Danny Ellerman, uh, Professor Elliman um, has been working most of his career in MIT in the United States, but he is now at the uh, Climate Policy Research Unit of the Loyola de Palacio Chair and um, at the European University Institute. And uh, I think that uh, um, Professor Elliman has done very useful research on ETS and in particular on elements related to carbon leakage, and that would be 
uh, one of the questions I'm going to uh, spell out in a few minutes. On my left, I have Dirk Forrester. Dirk is the president and the CEO of the International Emissions Trading Association. Uh, Dirk uh, is a US official, or a US citizen, sorry, and was a US official uh, working in the White House under the years of President Clinton. Um, so um, uh, the fourth uh, panelist is Felix Matitz. Uh, Felix is uh, from Berlin. He is the research coordinator on climate and energy policy at the Öko Institute. And for that reason, a very close observer on the German debate on the Energiewende. So uh, another uh, element that is uh, going to be uh, clearly on our table. But I suggest we start uh, with uh, Dirk Beusart first. Um, Dirk, it would be very important for us to know you as, uh, as a businessman, how you found the strong points and the weak points in the framework on climate and energy that we have today in place, and what, uh, in your view, would be the points we should particularly build on in a perspective of 2030. You have the floor, Dirk. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. Uh, good afternoon. Um, GDF Suez um, is one of the 10 main energy companies in Europe, and uh, the CEO of GDF Suez, um, Gerard Mestral, has been rather vocal about the disruption experienced by the energy sector in Europe in the last days. Globally, we have something like 82,000 billion of turnover worldwide, 140,000 employees, and we are an important player in the um, energy sector, electricity and gas in Europe, but also, and energy services, which is a very big part of our activities, but also a leading worldwide player. And uh, globally, my main activities have been the last 15 years mainly focused on activities outside Europe. Um, what can we learn out of all that? I would say, first of all, energy is a capital-intensive business. It's um, huge investments and long paybacks, if at the end you get paybacks, because that's less and less sure. So um, globally, for future investments, it's clear that predictability is key. It's the main element. What kind of predictability can you bring? And that depends on uh, energy and environmental policies, regulatory framework, and market mechanisms. And um, a lot of them are uh, really the focus of these days. But um, to have predictability, I would say, you need sustainability. Because um, to have a framework which is claimed predictable, but is not sustainable, and sustainability includes competitiveness, you can never really believe it. To be sustainable, it has also to be affordable. Affordable by industry and residentials, which are at the end the customers. And um, having traveled for 15 years and having doing business in almost the main countries around the world, I would say that I have some doubts there. I have some doubts about what Europe is doing. First of all, Europe has put in place a complex, unbundled electricity energy system, which is followed by almost no other country in the world. They simplified it, and simplifying already means less costs, because it's not only the environmental costs, it's also the costs of the system and the model that has been used to unbundle in Europe which is not, and we heard some elements about it this morning, it creates possibilities, but it creates huge intermediate costs. And that's not without importance. Transaction costs are important. And um, next to that, I think that Europe has to learn also that uh, the rest of the world is not necessarily following the example of what is Europe doing. That time is over. They are looking at their own, they are looking at their own um, more urgent needs, and they are also looking at what happens in the rest of the world to keep their competitiveness. Because it's a main element that when you speak today to uh, business and to uh, certainly to country leaders, in almost all countries of the world, one of the first elements is how to keep our competitiveness, how to keep an industrial growth 
and that's important. In that perspective, I also think that economic competitiveness will come more on the foreground in Europe because it's very important to count in the world and to count in the world you have to be a competitive environment. Secondly, for Europe in its actual situation, I would say it's the extremely important that the European economy keeps its competitiveness because it is necessary to have growth and that growth will be absolutely necessary to keep Europe together. And um, next to that, I also have to be, to make everyone aware that competitiveness, which is often seen in Europe as a monopoly, something we have for the last 200 years and that it will always stay. I think that we have to be cautious about that because that's less and less certain. On the other hand, I think when you look at uh, the market mechanisms, and some ha something has been said today about that this morning, the market mechanisms which have been put in place in Europe are an extreme unbundling and cutting in pieces of the different of the value chain. Next to that, it's based on the short-term marginal cost. There is no capacity payment, no some discussions are coming up to put it in place. Okay, it's, it's an extremely simplified model, which was not at all adapted to the kind of industry, but which could work as long as there was an oversupply. Um, and where uh, the uh, uplift on the uh, marginal cost would normally be a signal for investments. On the other hand, it has been combined with a huge amount of heavily subsidized renewables with a marginal cost of zero, so it's completely incompatible. Those, do, those two things on their own are already a problem. Combined, it's a disaster. And that's what exactly happens these days. First of all, I think that um, on renewables, I think uh, we are in favor of renewables and we are building a lot of renewables around the world. But I think that Europe, instead of having rolled out a huge amount of heavily subsidized renewables, should have put more money on the research and development before and coming to more competitive um, pricing. And then at that moment, that problem would have been less. I also think that Europe should have focused more and should focus more on energy efficiency. Because at the end, subsidies to energy efficiency are, okay, you can say it's a cost, but you don't drag it along for 20 years. The subsidies on renewables will drag it for 20 years and that will in a, an economic environment, as we know, not be an easy thing to do. So I think that that are elements that we should take into account. But um, I give with that some elements, I think, of answer to your question. Thank you, uh, Dirk. I, I take from what you are saying that uh, the model of, as you called it, extreme unbundling was probably a bit simplified and led to more costs. That combined with the renewables development uh, made us up to the risk of no longer being competitive. If I'm a little bit taking a shortcut, I think that's a very clear message. Denny Ellerman, Denny, um, you have been doing some research on the ETS, which was very well appreciated, but in particular on carbon leakage, the thing that has been uh, brought on the table all, uh, all the time. Uh, is there carbon leakage? What is the impact of our climate policy on competitiveness? It's an eternal question, a question that is also going to be with us very forcefully in developing anything we are going to do for 2030. And I think it's fair to say that the emerging economies, read China, combined now with the shale gas revolution in the United States, creates a lot of nervousness in, uh, in, in boardrooms. Um, how would be your take to this? Billy. Okay, thank you, Joss. Um, the commissioner made the answer to your first question quite easy f for me. I mean, she said there is, you know, when you get down into the numbers, you, you can't see it. And I think that is a good uh, summary of what has been a fair amount of research. We're nine years in on the ETS, on having a carbon price in Europe. If you look at the data on export, import trends, of course, the recession, the economic problems had a big effect. But even if you go before then, it isn't that there are no changes. 
it's just that the changes that were in place, the trends that were in place before 2005 were continuing through 2008. Of course, then we know there was a big disruption to the world economy. Imports went down, you know, exports also went down and so on. But if you look over this whole trend, you find essentially whatever those trends are, those are continuing and you can't find the evidence for the carbon price having had any sort of perceptible effect on trade patterns uh, in Europe. Now, I want to emphasize this is not in the sort of trade and competitive literature. This is not an unusual finding. It's a variation on what's called the pollution haven argument, which is, is broader than just a carbon price, but is environmental regulation in general. Does this account for the movement of steel factories from the United States to somewhere else or steel production, things like that? And invariably, when people look at this, it always comes back. No, they can't identify the environmental. It's because of getting close to markets where the investment opportunities are. It's because of natural resource access. It's labor cost. It's some other things. And so I think if we go more fundamentally into why do we not see more effect, or why have we not seen more effect on, say, carbon leakage, competitiveness is a broader issue, but on the carbon leakage, my short answer is it's just a price. And I think we have to recognize that there were good reasons for the location and the production levels of industry in Europe prior to 2005. And as an economist, I'd summarize that, that there were hundreds of prices that mattered and determined that we will locate a refinery here, we will put a steel mill here, we'll have cement, pulp paper, whatever it happened to be, why it's located in Europe. There was a reason for this. This was not some sort of random choice. And I would suggest to you that all of those factors, all of those prices remained as valid after 2005 as they did before. And that all that had changed is there was just one more price, and that was a carbon price. And of course, individual circumstances, you have to look at, okay, how important is that and the production cost of that particular uh, product and uh, how it affects uh, market demand and such. But I think that's the, that's the basic answer that we have to really, when you get down into the weeds and in the analysis of any investment analysis, you realize that it hasn't been that important. And that European industry is not existing on some knife edge where all that is required is one little extra push and then it all goes down the tubes. That, we don't see that. Now, I would enter one large qualification on that point, which is these results are valid for the carbon prices that we have seen that have been experienced in Europe. Now, they haven't always been five euros. You remember there was a considerable, considerable period of time where it was up to 25, even above 25 euros, stayed at 15 euros for about two years period. So in this nine year period, we're looking at a time in which you could not say carbon prices were trivial. But if Europe were to move to a position where let's say the price was greater than 50 euros, 100 euros, and it did not exist, you didn't have a comparable carbon price elsewhere, then I don't think these results would hold, but that'd be something we'd have to see. But I think at least the sort of carbon prices we're talking about in the world we deal with today, it, it's not there. I think the competitiveness issues are a broader concern. Uh, I am ceaselessly amazed at how much I hear about the shale gas revolution in the United States. I state this as an American who's had a career in energy before I found emissions trading. Uh, started out the Department of Energy in the 1970s. Uh, and of course, there is something different. There, in, a, in that perspective, I would say, you know, there's a sense of we've been here before. In the 1990s, natural gas was going to be available at 250 a million BTU for as far as the eyes could see. There was two gigawatts of combined cycle plants that were built on that premise, and they all went into bankruptcy because almost as soon as they were built, the price went up to unbelievably high levels. And of course, everybody, then you had a sort of a coal boom plant, and then shale gas came along. Now, I do think shale gas is different. Uh, there is a technology, I mean, there has been a change of technology. It's not a matter of reserve estimation, although that's part of it that you can say, when you look back in the 1990s, what happened to all of these estimates in the United States 
that there was going to be gas for as long as we could see at below $3 a million BTU or something like that. And it was basically in reserve estimates, which turned out to be wrong. Uh, however, I think the question you have to ask, you have to keep in mind that the shale gas revolution came about when natural gas prices were a lot higher than they were today. And the exhaustion of natural gas wells is different than the exhaustion of oil wells. And we see a lot of that flowing. And all of the drilling rigs are moving to oil. So there is a shale oil revolution in the United States, North Dakota. I hope I will not offend anyone by saying one of the most godforsaken corners of the North American continent <laughs> is a boom town. And the reason is very simple. If you, look, if you look at the economics, it's the same technology, basically, but you get $90 a barrel for the oil that you can find. And if you go into shale, if you're looking for gas, you get $3.50 or $4 in that range, which works out to like $24 a barrel. So it's not surprising why all the rigs and everything are migrating to oil. And I would just note, I think there's a fair degree of skepticism about the durability of the so-called shale gas revolution in the United States. And the answer's not in. I mean, I think it depends on the evolution of prices and how we'll see. But I think competitiveness is a bigger issue. I don't want to suggest that there aren't changes in competitiveness. My answer to your point is just we don't see it being related. There's nothing to suggest in the literature, and people have looked at it, and it's consistent with other types of similar things where you can pin changes of competitiveness on carbon prices. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denny. Um, I would summarize your story about uh, shale gas, look at shale oil, and look also at the time frame. Just before it happened, then is it going to continue? I think that's a very important lesson because lots of people in Europe are nervous about uh, the shale gas, shale oil, how it happened and what is going to bring us in the future. That combined with your first element, I think that uh, EDS did not change existing trends. And the trends of de-industrialization of Europe, I hardly dare to use the words, but that is what, uh, what, what was happening, um, were not changed through the ETS. Brings me to the next speaker, to Dirk Forrester. Uh, Dirk, um, you are from AITA, closely following the carbon market. Carbon leakage and the special regime is a very important element, but the carbon market on its own is going to stay as a pillar for 2030. But what would you stick out as the most important points for 2030? We know there is a surplus in the market that hangs out there that is depressing the prices. Um, we have a very complicated political process uh, around that, but you as AITA, bringing together all important market players, must have very pronounced ideas what we should do. I'm not going to promise we will do it, but uh, you know your take on how to redress the carbon market as part of the 2030 framework would be very important for us to, uh, to listen to. Thanks, Joss, and, and it is a pleasure to be here and, and to follow Denny. I, I wish I could sound as reasonable as Denny, and I think it's a little unfair to make me follow him, but, uh, but I'll do my best and give you a little flavor of how the, the conversation goes inside of AIDA about what markets should look like in, in 2030. And the starting point for my organization was... Uh, uh, we brought a bunch of people together to do some strategic thinking about this, was um, to think about how could a real price signal emerge that actually accomplished more than the current pricing signal does. Um, and there, I think, is a belief that uh, the current, we, we understand where the current sort of three-prong target came from, but really what we would like to see is for the carbon price to emerge as the central pillar of European policy, so that it's less obscured by uh, uh, things that happen in other sectors. And so what that's led us to thinking about is over the course of the coming decade, uh, thinking about ways of converging 
um, other policies that have an effect on this in the renewable energy efficiency space and to a, a, a place of supporting the carbon price more rather than uh, creating confusion. So we're looking for centrality of the ETS amongst its peers and EU policy making. So as I think about what that looks like and how to get from here to there, I think there are three areas of linkage that are important. We use this word linkage a lot in, in AIDA because we do like coherence in uh, policy approaches, and we also like uh, linkages amongst markets because we think that actually that's a way of getting at the competitiveness issues that Denny talked about. So when I think about those linkages, one of them relates to the other policies. And can we find ways to better integrate renewable policy and energy efficiency policy? We're giving some hard thought to specific recommendations around that, but I can't say that we've actually arrived at what the right answer is. But we think that that ought to be a goal. Secondly, we think that there ought to be a linkage to, um, to Europe's ultimate ambition for greenhouse gases and for what the ETS sectors should accomplish in that. Uh, right now, we know that the, the European targets for 2020 are kind of set at the lower end of the range of what um, policymakers in Europe originally envisaged. And if you carry them out to 2050, they don't exactly get Europe where, where you want to be. So in a sense, I think my membership knows that another, uh, another shoe is yet to drop on that topic. And frankly, I think people would like to have clarity about that sooner rather than later so that it can begin to inv influence investment trends more gradually rather than potentially exposing uh, companies to a big step change at some point in time. So clarity sooner rather than later on what the ambition is going to be. And I know that you're going to turn right back to me and say, so what do you think it should be for 2030? And I don't have the answer yet, but I know that you guys have some thoughts around that that we'll hope to comment on in the, in the coming weeks. Um, the, the third is, uh, in the area of linkage, is to have a continued effort at influencing other systems that are being designed and encouraging good systems to grow up in other countries so that there are common approaches that hopefully enable the global community to step forward with greater ambition because of the cost effectiveness of linked systems. Um, so that would be another area. And again, I know this is, an, uh, this is a uh, policy priority for Europe in, uh, and has been for some time. You did great work with Australia. Unfortunately, the electorate has taken us on a bit of a detour in Australia. Uh, maybe they'll be back at some point in time. Uh, but I don't think that's the only example of linkage that could be important. And I do hope that there's follow through just in, in terms of uh, neighbors close by but also as we think uh, down the line about other systems that may come into play. Um, I'm hoping that Europe continues to make an effort in, in uh, looking for opportunities for linkage with other systems. Right now, the place that we see the most uh, concrete example of it is in North America between California and the province of Quebec. And they were present in Warsaw last week uh, at senior level, sort of talking about their example and, and uh, hoping to do more of that with other other uh, states and provinces in North America. So I, I do think that those forms of linkage are also going to be important for us in thinking about a 2030 package. Now, when I think about how to get from here to there, I, I really uh, applaud the work that the Commission has done in focusing industries thinking around a set of structural reform options that we've certainly been in the midst of evaluating. Uh, there were six originally. I think before you had six, we had 12. So you should feel good about only having six because that showed more focus. Uh, but more recently, it seems like the thinking has, um, has focused even further on li the linear reduction factor, on uh, the possibility of cancellation of some allowances, or the possible of using some kind of an um, automatic supply adjustment mechanism. Um, and first, I should say that um, as we look at those things, we think that the backloading step was a very positive one, and we're hoping for follow through on that because that's sort of the appetizer before the main course of, of structural reforms. Um, but then as we uh, think about what's coming for dessert, we also know that it needs to have a sort of a, a continuity between what happens in backloading and the 2030 target. So let me talk about the, at least how we're approaching those three areas of reform. Um, 
The linear reduction factor has some fans. Uh, it's one that would be predictable and would be one where we would say currently it doesn't look like the, the current step changes are in line with uh, Europe's stated ambition for 2050. Um, cancellation is one that I think people have more nervousness about because it's sort of really, f I think people think of it as similar to a change in the target because it's taking a large, potentially a large amount of supply out of the system. The one that's drawn, I think, the most attention inside of AIDA is uh, one that um, I'm, I'm labeling a strategic reserve, but others talk about more as a, a structural supply adjustment mechanism. And what's interesting about that one is that um, uh, it, it could provide features of, uh, of providing, I guess, signals for the market that are stable because you kind of understand with clarity about when interventions would take place. You would understand uh, ahead of time, so you'd have a, a good, clear sense of that. But also, it has the potential of taking the current problem and, and maybe treating it as a bit more of an opportunity. And by that I mean um, you could take some of the uh, allowances that could build up in times of excess and put them in a reserve so that if you had the polar opposite um, case in the future of a supply shortage, that they could be utilized then. Um, California has such a system sort of built into theirs. Theirs is more price-based. I think we've got some people nervous about price-based systems and I think have been uh, more enamored lately about the possibility of um, a structural option that would look more just at the <coughs> fundamental supply-demand dynamics. And uh, I do think uh, w when I step back and, and I think about, as Denny was alluding to, uh, sort of what's happened in recent years in shale gas that has been a big surprise to the market. And on the other side, there's also been the Fukushima disaster that was a surprise in the other direction. And I don't know what's going to come over the next decade, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to keep having surprises. And I don't know which way they will cut for Europe. So I think it's, uh, it's really wise to consider an approach to dealing with the current um, excess supply or you, many of my organization view it as inadequate demand in the system, uh, but to use that as a bit of an opportunity to create a, a strategic answer to that that could be good in, in uh, times of uh, plenty or times of want. So I, I hope that gives a little bit of flavor of, of how uh, how we're thinking about it and how I think we're leaning toward a package f in terms of dealing with uh, the surplus uh, of, of the present day that gives a clear signal of where things are going and puts industry on the path that it needs to be on for doing its fair share of the 2050 uh, ambition and everything between now and then. Um, that starts that with a backloading arrangement, but also builds in a, partic a particular kind of a solution in the near term that could, uh, could automatically uh, handle some of those concerns. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. Uh, I think you, you uh, put your finger rightly on where we are working very hard on, but uh, as I mentioned and I suggested, uh, we have not yet uh, made up our mind. Uh, there is the option of uh, reviewing the linear correction factor. There is the option of, a, as you called it, the structural adjustment mechanism. But your point is fairly well taken. Uh, we have, it is hard to predict exactly what is going to happen between today and 2030. There may be other surprises who would have uh, anticipated the very deep uh, double dip recession. According to some, even we are not sure whether we are getting out of the double dip. So uh, that, that, that's a, a very important point taken and we, we learned that perhaps we have to reflect on how to create a vehicle where we can absorb these kind of shocks. Um, I also took your point about common approaches in the world. Um, the country you did not manage uh, is China uh, because China is moving ahead with its uh, uh, pilot schemes. Uh, in uh, the coming six, eight months, they are going to have seven pilot schemes, very different from the pilot schemes we, or the word pilot we are using in Europe. These schemes are very big. They would uh, they cover a fifth of the Chinese population. So uh, that's quite something. Uh, it comes close to, to, to the scope of the, of the system we are having in Europe. And we are working very hard, as you know, with the Chinese uh, to exchange uh, our thoughts and our experiences 
on the benchmarks and on monitoring, reporting, verification on the registry and things like that. If China were to, kin to continue that move, and as I heard uh, Vibes in Warsaw uh, last week, where it was said that they are planning for a national rollout of their pilot schemes on ETS in the next five-year plan, if that were to materialize, I think that then, then we would uh, uh, come much closer to a world in which there is a price globally put on carbon. So, uh, um, you know, we keep that very firmly in the back of our head. Our last intervention is from uh, Felix Mattis. Felix uh, is a uh, first row observer about the Energiewende debate. Um, and I think that, uh, Felix, it would be very useful if we would have your take about what you have been following on the Energiewende and as we speak, very important decisions being made in Berlin and how we in Europe are preparing for a 2030 uh, perspective. I think that's the combination of the two is not always that clear. It is all about uh, similar subjects as we can follow, but at the same time, what is the policy take that uh, we could uh, optimize between uh, what is happening in Berlin and what is happening in the EU for 2030 could be very useful for us to know some insights of. Do you have the floor? Thank you, Joss. Uh, thank you for this question. And uh, before I answer to your question, I must admit two things. The first is uh, I've spent too many years and too many days and nights of my life with the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme, so, so and so I'm biased in favor of it. Uh, you have to take uh, this bias into account. Uh, and if the strike uh, allows me, I will, I will head after, immediately after this panel to the airport to fly to Beijing to the launch of the Beijing Provincial Scheme, which will occur tomorrow. Uh, the second is uh, I'm not a German official and I'm neither responsible nor happy with the text which is negotiated uh, today and tomorrow on the coalition agreement. Um, but anyway, uh, but as a good German you have to reflect on uh, the interactions between Europe and, uh, and, and your home country and I would like to make three remarks. The first remark is in uh, observation. And this observation is, to be very frank, that we are already in the middle of a process of renationalization of energy policy and also on climate policy. And I think we have to, uh, we have to reflect this, that we are already in this process. And the interesting point is why are we in this process? Because uh, the answer to this question why we are there is uh, is one of the preconditions uh, to, to reverse this trend. And there are two reasons. The first is that we have increasingly a divergence on the level of ambition in climate policy and in energy policy. And it is very clear if it comes to Germany and others, there are clear differences in the level of ambition. And the other point is, and that's even more complicated, that we have a divergence in the structure of ambitions. So uh, it is not longer the case that reduction of greenhouse gases is the, is the overall accepted uh, driver of the, trans of the transition in my country, and I will come back, uh, back to this later, is the transition toward renewables, it's, it's, it's overarching. And so the structure of the ambitions is changing. And we have to reflect this if we if we if we want to go uh, if we want to go for 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 solutions. That brings me to my second point: What are the implications of the energy transition in Germany or the Energiewende, which is, by the way, an, an synthetic word which was invented by colleagues of mine uh, more than 30 years ago? Uh, you should never read this book again. Uh, uh, in the good old times, the energy transition, the Energiewende book was. Uh, uh, was a transition towards a system of energy efficiency, renewables, and domestic coal, uh, uh, again, 30 years ago. Um, okay, what, what, what are the implications of the Energiewende to the EU climate policy? And I think there are three major deep impacts. The first is that a challenge which is ahead of all European countries uh, which is 
that we live in an underinvested system, especially in the power sector, and where heavy investment is needed. That this country, Germany, has given a very clear direction to these investments. And it has so a strong technology specific component going for a transition towards renewables, excluding nuclear, excluding CCS. That's a clear decision uh, which will guide all the policies. And this is a specific policy which was not foreseen in the, f in the past framework of the European Union. The second point on the impact is that the process which is pushed forward in Germany is accelerating, but it is not creating, it's, it's accelerating fundamental questions on the economic basis of the future power system. And the economic basis of the, of the future power system consists of what is the role of price signals and are these price signals from the markets we have at the moment sufficient to create sufficient revenue streams for payback <coughs> of investments. These are two different but two painful questions. And my first observation is that uh, Germany will learn the hard way that there is no alternative to coordinate the system without basing it on price signals. And there's a very simple reason for this. Because it's, it's an extremely coordination intensive system. I failed before my summer holidays to load the recent uh, 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 registry of German power generators into my Excel. And I have the most modern Excel. We are today at 23% power generation from renewables and of this is 19% new renewables. We are running this system with 1.4 million electricity generators. And we are used to run the system with 200 power plants uh, for the last decades. And I have no idea how we can, org how we can we coordinate this system in, in operations and investments without basing it on price signals. But on the other hand, we see very clearly that the recent market design, that the recent markets will not deliver the revenue streams for investments. And that's also on, these, on, on all these subsidy issues. Uh, in, if you are living in a high penetration world of renewables or might be nuclear, whatever, then you can recalculate what the carbon price must be to be sufficient for payback for investments. Because if the wind blows, the, the, uh, the, the electricity price at the wholesale market is zero. And you have to drive the carbon price for these technologies to levels of 100, 150, 170 dollars or uh, euro per, per ton of CO2 to create a revenue stream. So we, we need to have an enlightened debate on capacity payments for the flexibility options, on capacity payments for the renewables. And we have to see the EU ETS as a segment of the market design. We cannot separate the issue of the, of the EU ETS from the other market design issues because the costs which are not covered by these EU ETS will come back with another label. And the, and, the, and the alternative label will be capacity market, whatever else. And so, we, 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 and, we, 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 and, and the German development is tabling this challenge because it is extremely accelerated by the fast rollout of renewables. And the, last po and the, and the third point is that, that the interactions be between the greenhouse gas emissions and these complementary policies are not negligible. The, the, the current crisis of the EU ETS is not primarily caused by the rollout of renewables. Its macroeconomic shock is the external cre credits. The rollout of renewables is in an EU-wide perspective exactly on the pathway w uh, which was reflected in 2008. But coincidentally, coincidentally, the next external shock could be not a macro macroeconomic shock. The next external shock could be and high impact complementary policy on renewables, nuclear, cold fusion, or whatever else. And that leads me to the consequences for European policies. The first is I'm, I'm still in very much in favor of the three targets because the three different targets gives you the only solid ground to assess the interactions between the different policies. 
And as a consequence of this, and that is the second point for the European Union, is that we need a short-term fix of the EU ETS. We have, we have two billion surplus and we, we have to deal with this, but we have also to think about flexibility options, how to deal with macro, exo, exogenous macroeconomic shocks and potential high-impact po complementary policies. And we have to find mechanisms to adjust this. And the third uh, uh, implication of this, and the Commission will hate me for this, if you really buy the arguments I brought forward, then we need not only the three targets for 2030. In a nutshell, we need a new climate and energy package. Because we can't isolate the climate issues from the needs in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, adjusting market structures. And if Europe doesn't take seriously these challenges of market design, etc., etc., then we will lose the European dimension. And last short remark, and this is, uh, I, I bring also always forward this in Berlin, because Berlin is ignoring it, and it's a shame. And the new coalition agreement, they are raising they are raising the European dimension of all these energy and environmental stuff in one sentence, in one bad sentence. And this country uh, is ignoring systematically the European dimension, although Europe provides two essential mechanisms. The first is, and you can make these modeling experiments, if you run your, your power sector model, and if you shut down all the interconnectors, the German system would have been imploded. And so, so the integration, at least in the regional market, is one of the most important flexibility options for Germany and for the others. And therefore, uh, and therefore it's a crazy situation that the country, which is depending so much on this European dimension, is ignoring this, this dimension much. And the second is, uh, and that is also an issue, if we are not able to fix the EU ETS, and that is a German perspective, then the German energy vendor is ending in a structure of renewables and lignite. That's the final mix. If we are failing to, pr if we are failing to put a price on carbon, and this can only be done in the European framework, we are ending with the cleanest and the dirtiest option. And that is, and that's a problem, and that cannot be a robust or a sustainable target. Thank you very much, uh, Felix, for uh, your very thoughtful uh, remarks. Um, just to take up your last argument, uh, strong plea to uh, look in all capitals towards the European dimension and vice versa. And the other element uh, that I take from what you have been saying is this strong German orientation towards renewables, which requires another thinking about the organization of the market. Your quote, 200 uh, producers of electricity in the past, today 1,400,000. Uh, that's quite, quite a, a difference. And also, second element uh, with renewables, how to make sure that support schemes or the market is organized in such a way as there is a payback for investments. Otherwise, uh, uh, this is going to, to end in, uh, in, in a deadlock. So uh, I thank you very much for these uh, strong, uh, strong messages. OK, we have heard our panels. I think quite a variety of ideas. Uh, what I would take, however, is that if we can cope with the competitiveness concerns that Dirk was very much uh, uh, underlining. Then I, I see all speakers uh, seeing the role for the ETU, ETS as a very important element of energy markets. But there it stops because the other reality of how energy markets are organized and are developing is of equal importance. I think that's the, the benefit of taking the climate and the energy dimension together <coughs> in, in one go uh, in our discussion today. I open up the floor for questions, uh, comments that you may have. Do we have a microphone? Do we not? Yes, we have a question here, a first question, and it would take a few questions. If there are more, 
Okay, I have a second question and a third question. Please do go ahead and, and tell us whom you are. Yeah. So, Fernand Felsinger, I'm president of EFEC Europe, the Association of Industrial Energy Consumers. Actually, there is a point in common between Connie Hedegaard and Barack Obama, uh, which is they like to speak about steel. Since uh, two weeks ago, Mr. Obama was in Cleveland, Ohio, and made a declaration, which is which was, well, look at what we have done with our energy policy over the past five years. This plant, if it would be located in Germany, its energy costs would be three times higher. Thanks to our policy, this attracts hundreds of billions of investments from Europe to the United States. The other reason why I'm quoting, <laughs> uh, referring to steel, is example given by Connie Hedegaard about uh, the, the ArcelorMittal example, which is a true example. But it raises a question. If you move production from the most cost efficient plant in the world in Europe to the United States, which is less efficient, you make money. So <laughs> the ETS, how it, the way it is designed, gives an incentive to move industry outside of Europe. So while, in fact, if this production would have increased in Europe, it would have been greener, would have emitted less CO2 on an inter integrated basis, etc. This example, and this example to show that there is a very important problem about climate policy in Europe, is that it is not linked with industrial policy. And another example is the CEO of Vestalpine, who said recently about the cross-sectorial factor, that this will lead steel plants in Europe to close because the target which would be necessary to avoid buying allowances would be beyond thermodynamic limits, which is impossible, we know. So don't you think that it is hard time to link climate and energy policy to industrial policy, not only to create jobs, not only to create more welfare in Europe, but even for environmental and sustainability reasons? Thank you very much. Can I probe you a little bit? What do you exactly mean by combining climate and industrial policy? I mean, these are two chapters, and I would like to see what is exactly what you are pointing out. Uh, more precisely, we all hear about the necessity to reform the ETS system. Actually, but the question is, in which sense, in which direction? We are convinced that the ETS must be reformed urgently and to make it really the tool for the future, a global tool which can be adopted once we have a global agreement. But for this, it must not be a tool against growth. It must be a tool promoting growth. Today, the European system, which is very different from the Australian system, which you, <laughs> which you know, for instance, is not dynamic. It promotes production decline. Why? Because of this, the fact that the allowances are based on historical data rather than on actual product, production. So one, for instance, one example to improve would be to change this rule and to make it more dynamic. If you look at the Australian system as well, you look at the benchmarks. The benchmarks are not defined in the way they are defined in the European system. Actually, Europe is killing its own industry by rules which do not take into account technical reality. Okay, well, lots of food for thought, and I'm going to turn to uh, Denny or anybody else from uh, the panel in a minute. Uh, but on the technological reality, I, I just would like to flag the word that there is a benchmark, you know, uh, kind of system that has been developed. And I would like to have Denny or anybody else in the panel reflecting uh, do they miss the point, yes or no? I mean, because the benchmarks are very much at the heart of the industrial r reality, I would assume, because they are were uh, developed together with industry. I have here in front, and can you tell us whom you are, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Jan Moen. I'm a consultant for the regulator Norway. Uh, I have one question concerning <coughs> renewables and capacity markets. According to newspapers and press releases in Norway, 
that we propose uh, uh, cables and exporting hydropower to compensate for the capacity market and ensure that you can have a sound policy on renewables. The last rumors tells that this will be turned down, both from Germany and UK. Do anyone have any comments on that? We seem to that could be a reasonable and cost-effective solution, but in the last minute get positive signals from other politicians, but very skeptical comments from both UK and Germany. Please, if you have a comment, I would like to hear them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, I will have to turn to Felix for that or uh, anybody else, but I'd first take the, the next question. Can I have the microphone here? Mark? Um, yeah, I support the last comment. No, the commission. Who are you? I will. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Mark Johnston from EPC. This is the third time I've spoken, spoken today. Um, I support the last comment. Um, the, the commission is the guardian of the treaties, so the rules in the treaties is the job of the commission and the other institutions to apply. And whilst Norway is not a full member state, it's committed to the internal market and um, deserves to be treated on that basis. But anyway, two questions, one internal, one external. Internally, on the European situation, um, Dirk, on the, the seems to me the McGree Group agenda has already failed on its own terms. There will be no treaty reform, which your CEO asked for last month, and uh, the Commission's or the Energy Department of the Commission has already rejected the possibility of compensation for bad investments, particularly in gas. Um, but on the point about subsidies, and you said several times renewables were heavily subsidised. Would you accept that all fossil fuels, let's say, let's say all fossil fuels in network energy, exclude transport for now, all fossil fuels are heavily subsidised uh, for the following reason, that the whilst we have uh, a cap and trade scheme, ETS, and pollution pricing, the parameters of that framework law do not correspond to the science of the problem. So in effect we have a cap that allows 60 gigatons over 60 years and the science would really require about half of that if we were honest about the scale and urgency of climate change. So in that sense fossil fuels are subsidised because they don't today pay enough a high enough carbon price. Would you accept that? Second question um, on the external situation and in fact to, to Jos. Um, could you say a few words about, I mean, coming back to where Connie started at the beginning of the afternoon and, and Warsaw to Paris, etc. cetera, um, what is the union's external action service? Uh, in what way is that gearing up to support the Paris Agreement? The Paris Agreement will be a huge lift for the whole world. As Connie said, there's an awful lot to do. Um, the External Action Service has a climate diplomacy mandate from foreign ministers renewed in July. And surprisingly, um, these days, foreign ministers take a stronger line on the climate crisis than, in fact, environment ministers do. Um, the External Action Service has uh, considerably more resources than, than your team. It's about 20 times the number of staff and, of course, the 200 delegations all over the world. So how can... You know, for this very big global problem, and you're wishing to be a leader, how can we ensure we deploy all our resources to get the best deal in Paris? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would, uh, because we have not that much time left, I would do a final check whether there are burning questions. There is one burning question, a short one from Andre Marku, and then we give the floor to all four panelists and also uh, giving them the opportunity to react on what they heard uh, from one another. Andre. Yeah. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Andre Marku from the microphone. From, from, from the uh, Center for European Policy Studies, uh, very, two very quick questions uh, following up on the 2015 agreement. What competitiveness, obviously, a very important issue. and. It is not something under UNFCCC, but there will be aspects that will relate to that. And what would you see as important in that agreement that would directly or indirectly address that? Second thing is to, to Danny, we're doing a lot of work on, on, uh, on carbon leakage. And two questions, is the future a good representation of, or is the past a good representation of the future? And the second question would be, 
we look at this as very much as a cost price discussion going forward and how do you see that being addressed meaning a high price of of EU ETS that seems to be desirable by some but also how would that relate to the cost to those that are being paying the price thank you thanks very much so um, I start with uh, Denny and uh, feel free also to react if there is a uh, a need to react to what I, you heard from your fellow panelists. Denny. Okay, let me go through. I can't say anything about the two plants that were raised, the, the plant that President Obama talked about versus whatever the European plant and, and so on on that. I do, as someone who spent a lot of time in energy policy, and particularly American energy policy, I guess have a little bit of doubt when I hear politicians claim, or in this case the president claiming credit for his energy policy uh, is the cause of this. I, I understand the political imperatives of saying that. I realize all of that, but I think as serious-minded analysts, we ought not to take that at face value. Uh, so you hear this like the shale revolution is my revolution. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't buy that. Um, I think I've already answered in terms of what, you know, is carbon price killing European industry. I, I just don't think the evidence supports that. Uh, and, you know, maybe at a much higher price uh, it would. You do raise, I don't know, I mean, we're really getting into the weeds of issues like free allocation, but the gentleman who made the intervention started talking about, well, dynamic allocation. I mean, this is in the <coughs> jargon is output-based allocation, that somehow the allocation ought to relate to the levels of production of what you export, which in fact has quite a bit of following and was represented, for instance, in the failed US bill, that was in there. There was output-based allocation, that was the way they were gonna do it. Unlike in Europe, where it is benchmarked on this historic benchmark, and of course, you'd still, if it were output-based using those benchmarks, there'd be some advantage. Whether this would give you that much lift, I think, again, is, you know, you'd have to get back into the into the into the numbers uh, on that. You know, the ultimate solution to this competitiveness is carbon prices elsewhere in the world. I mean, in some ways, this is a this is a transitional. We could say from a grand scheme. I mean, really thinking blue sky thinking. It's a transitional problem. Um, and I, I guess in that respect, I mean, whatever the price in Europe will be, whether it's going to be high or low, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with that, and we'll see what sort of agreement eventuates on this. Uh, I do think that there is a question that the European position of leadership in climate policy succeeds uh, or depends on its success for dealing with the problem of climate with having other areas of the world take similar measures or particularly adopt a trading system. So we've heard in China and various things. So that's that. And the question I would raise is whether in pursuing such a policy, having much higher prices helps other people join the system or whether there may be a strategy, which I would call broad and then deep. We know the ultimate let's say the scientific basis is you need a broad coalition and you need to reduce emissions a lot. And which comes first? So I'm not totally convinced that, you know, you need, that a low price is a bad thing right now when you're trying to get other people to come into the system. Thank you, Denny. Dirk? Okay, perhaps on the first question, uh, competitiveness, of course, is a complex element and uh, there are different elements in it, not only uh, the energy cost, not only... Uh, CO2 cost, but also salaries and other things. So I think it's comparing difficult uh, situation. On the other hand, I would uh, mention one other thing, and that was a little in, inherent in your question. I would not say that necessary industries built other places in the world or have a, a worse effect on environment than those in Europe. I can assure you that uh, most of the things that we build almost in all places of the world are at least supporting the same standards as what we have in Europe. Even in some places, it's even more difficult. So, okay, that's the first element. Uh, second uh, element on about uh, the gas plants, uh, the uh, non-compensation for bad investments. Um, there are different things about it. First of all, don't forget that uh, Europe has put in place a system of uh, short-term marginal costs 
without capacity payments. Um, gas plants are there also fall apart for system security, and they are not remunerated for it. Um, and that's one of the things that's under discussion in a lot of places in the world at this moment, and certainly in Europe. Next to that, um, be aware that um, renewables has been put in the market on a political decision for a big part based on a short-term marginal cost of zero, which is globally because they are already paid for through the, the subsidies, which creates a, an unbalance in the system and has huge consequences on the system marginal cost, short-term marginal cost. That, that is a little what's behind those, uh, those problems. On the other hand, when you are saying, okay, fossil fuels are subsidized and renewables um, are also on the other side and fossil f uh, fuels are not enough um, paying, I think um, it's, it's a complex issue. First of all, we have never been against uh, a cost for carbon. We have even advocated at some moments that it could increase. But what we ask for is something predictable and not something that moves up and then for unpredictable political reasons goes completely the other way out. I think um, the uh, level at which it is put has some uh, consequences of what are political decisions which are taken. We can cope with all that, that's not a problem. But what we are asking for is that have to, for long-term investments, that we need the predictability that's necessary. And uh, then we will adapt uh, our future investments to that. And, uh, and it's then up to Europe and to the industries to see if they can live with it in a competition with the rest of the world. Because I think it's a little too simple to, uh, to see Europe as an island and that nothing comes in or out. And that's far away from uh, the reality. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dirk. And I pass over to the other Dirk. <laughs> Dirk, uh, uh, there was uh, a number of questions also related to emissions trading. So, so I just wanted to touch on two of them. Um, uh, the first being the question about um, competitiveness over here, which I didn't address a whole lot. But I guess I, we probably have some common members in your association and my association. It's something that my members pay close attention to. But I want to really stress something that I took out of your remarks, which is, I actually think the problem you're addressing is climate policy and not emissions trading. The question is whether you have a serious cl climate policy in Europe that affects pricing. And I can think of a lot worse policies that Joss and some of his friends were thinking about cooking up a few years ago. Sorry, Joss. But that there were other ideas being cooked up a few years ago that didn't offer any of the flexibilities that emission trading brings that actually allow you to address some of the competitiveness issues. Maybe not all of them but at least some of them. Um, and I think this ties back to Andre's question, so I'm going to link that in. And that is, uh, um, what, what does Europe need, I think, out of it? At least from my vantage point, it needs uh, the point Denny raised. It needs a system that brings all major emitters into, into the abatement system because that's really what gets at competitiveness is if other countries are serious about carbon policy. And the second piece of it is I do think the market architecture, the availability of flexibility mechanisms and the ability to link across systems so that you can go wherever on the globe the low-cost abatement opportunities are and, and seize those and bring them to market. That's critical. And that, frankly, was a big disappointment out of Poland, I know for you and for me as well, that we didn't get more clarity about what the future of markets is going to be. But that doesn't mean we don't work on it really hard. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dirk. And Felix, uh, also the question that was asked by our Norwegian colleague, I don't know whether you have more insights on that. No, unfortunately, I have, I have no, no, no insights on this. But uh, if, it, if it turns to be true, then it's a shame. I think because, because always network infrastructure is one of the cheapest flexibility options, but it won't be the only one. And I think <coughs> as, a, as, a, as a reflection on this, on this discussion on the uh, subsidies for, uh, for uh, um, generation options with, with, with very low short-term marginal abatement uh, short-term marginal cost, I think we should make a distinction between the existence of technologies which are in the market, which have extremely low short-term marginal cost, and the way they were financed. The reality, however, these technologies come into the market, will 
uh, will create certain structures of the market. And that, and that, was, and that was my point. Uh, we have to think about uh, this reality that uh, in a decarbonized market, uh, the technologies will be, or the dominating technologies will be uh, technologies with extremely low short-term marginal cost. And a market which cannot pay back for a gas turbine will never be able to pay back for wind turbine, and that, that's, the, that's the way we have to think about uh, beyond the existing uh, uh, market design. The second is, uh, and, I, and, 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 and uh, um, I did for two times in Germany the allocation for the steel industry. And this is my, this is my absolutely favorite sector. And I think we have in the EU ETS a lot of mechanisms for com compensation. And the steel industry gives me the example to say that we have already overdone. We have a free allocation uh, for the steel industry on a very preferential base period. The steel industry is the only industry which gets more or less full allocation for their power generation plants. In Germany, these plants which get full allocation free allocation for their power generation. They get, in addition, compensation for the indirect costs of carbon dioxide, for a path through of carbon costs where they have been already compensated by free allocation. In addition, these guys pay no longer a contribution to the network access fees. In addition, they profit from wholesale market prices which are pushed down by renewables where they don't deliver where they don't deliver any con uh, contribution and if there is one one big winner of this energy vendor and this transition then this is the energy intensive industry at the moment and that leads me to the point that we have to discuss on compensation mechanisms on instruments but I got the impression in between that this debate is much more on the fundamental and fundamentalistic issue of climate policy, yes or no. And there the discussion has turned, uh, turned around. And I think that it's a dead end that leads to nothing. Uh, because we have sufficient compensation mechanisms. And the last remark, this output-based uh, allocation has been in many, in many schemes of the world be planned as in phase in, as in phase in of, uh, of, 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 of emissions trading. What this output based allocation does, it removes the incentive for the optimal level of production. And that means it removes a significant part of the efficiency. That means it drives the carbon price in future. That means it will be more expensive for all. And I think that is part of the truth which should be also raised if you, if you come to this. We have sufficient means to this. And the last remark is on, on, on Andre. It's, it's, it's yes, the past is not the blueprint for the future. But we have a much better indicator. The better indicator is the investment. And if you have a look on the long time series for the energy intensive industries in Europe for the last 15 years and have a look to the investment cycles, we are still in the range we have been for the last 15 to 20 years. And investment is a hard indicator, even for the future. Thank you, uh, Felix. There was a last question about the EA. Yes, yes, we are intensifying our cooperation with them. Uh, I think that it is true to say that our delegations and our network of delegations is uh, increasingly taking up the job. Uh, they had their own debate about security dimension. Um, but beyond that, the, uh, we have very good cooperation with them. Uh, for example, before the Warsaw Summit, uh, the march is being done, the questions are being asked. I, I think uh, we, we, we are cooperating uh, increasingly well, uh, well together on, on, on this issue, and that's going to intensify towards the Paris Agreement, uh, obviously. I would like to thank everybody for this uh, very useful debate. Uh, I would summarize it in two lines. Uh, will the new energy and climate package for 2030 look different compared to the old one? Yes, obviously. But the key elements are going to stay in place. 
the ETS is going to stay in place somewhat differently. We can discuss on carbon leakage, we can discuss on structural measures. Renewables is going to be part of the equation, but it opens up, I think Felix was very convincing on that, a raft of new questions on which we are perhaps only at the beginning of realizing what number of changes we'll have to incorporate it in order to have a good match between climate and energy policy. And my last point would be that we have to keep the European dimension. It's a lose-lose when we would go for energy and climate questions back to the national solution. I think that element uh, clearly came out of the discussion. And uh, from Dirk, I think uh, that we have to have an open eye on the world. We are not an island. No one claims that climate change, for example, can be controlled only through actions in Europe. But it would be foolish to claim that we are responsible for no longer than 10, 11% of uh, global emissions. But we have to have our eye on the world and at the same time develop the European dimension. I think that's the only reasonable way to go. And I thought that that was emerging very clearly from the discussions we were having this afternoon. So thanks very much for your attention. And now I hand over to the organizers uh, for the parallel sessions, I guess. Um, as I observed on the program. Jean-Michel. Thanks to you, gentlemen.